Okay, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this rainy afternoon. We have a couple of bits of data to look at today, um, so let me get to that information. All of this will be uh, very useful as we try to navigate that first wave of the pandemic and begin to look at reopening our economy while keeping that reproductive or that transmission in our community as low as we possibly can. So let me get to the data for today. So currently we have 702 uh, patients that are hospitalized within the task force hospitals. Uh, that's up compared to yesterday where we had 678. And again, that number will fluctuate daily, uh, but we keep our eye on the trend over time. And I'll show you an updated chart with uh, some of that trend data here in just a second. Uh, and also remember that these are patients that are COVID positive plus patients under investigation. So we're waiting to see what their test results are. Uh, there were 160 intensive care unit patients, which was about the same as yesterday at 159. And then we had 121 patients on ventilators, which was up from 113 yesterday. Um, and of course, we always like to show our slide about discharges. So we had another 42 COVID patients discharged yesterday from our hospitals, which brings us up to 1,209 patients that have uh, been discharged since we had our first case of reported COVID uh, within our region. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about trends. You heard me mention this in the previous slide. Um, this uh, is really important as we try to understand what the reproductive rate or how we're performing or what the spread is like in the community. And this gives us a reasonable approximation of, of what that looks like. It's um, delayed data, if you think about it, um, People become infected, uh, then they have to uh, become symptomatic, and then they, then they reach the hospital, and that's when they hit our, our graphs. So it's a little bit of a delayed signal, but still it's a good signal for us to use to understand what's going on in the community. Um, because testing capacity is, remains an issue, both here locally as well as nationally, um, we believe our hospitalization data is, is a better indicator of what the status of the virus is. Um, but we are pretty confident that uh, our testing capacity is going to be growing um, into the future. I think, as I mentioned yesterday, I was at our, our local lab here, and they felt confident as well that the testing capacity was going to continue to grow. And uh, I've heard from other uh, uh, testing partners within the state that that has also continued to grow. So this slide shows the moving average that we showed yesterday uh, for the first time. And it, again, includes those confirmed uh, COVID positive patients and patients under investigation that we show every day. Um, and so this chart is showing that the number of patients is still elevated from where we started in early April um, up until around the 21st through the 24th on that seven day moving average, it was higher than 700. Uh, it's been down a little bit over the last couple of days around 681. Um, while the trend line looks uh, pretty flat and steady, um, today's hospitalizations, as you, as you remember, is still significantly higher than, than when we started this back on April, April 5th. So we're encouraged by the data, though, because as you can see on the curve, it, 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 has, it was coming up and then it sort of flattened. Uh, and, and we're seeing that continue uh, through the remainder of this week. And, and really the, the reason for that is because of all the tremendous work that's going on in the community with our public health partners, with the elected officials, uh, really um, uh, putting forth all those policies, planning, and then all of the people in the community responding to flatten that curve. And so it's, it's, um, it actually is, is uh, it's nice to see and it's a credit to everybody's hard work. Um, it will be really critical though to continue to follow the guidance uh, that everybody has put out. So as, as you can recall, we, we want the curve to come down and that's dependent upon uh, what happens out in the community, the transmission in the community. And so as we, as we look forward to this curve coming down, um, a lot of that is dependent upon uh, the transmission that's going on right now um, amongst the people within the community. Um, and so that's the end of our, our data presentation and now I'd be happy to address some questions from the media. So reporters heard reports of some healthcare workers testing positive for the virus. Do you have any information on how they contracted the virus as well as whether they are infecting loved ones? We know that healthcare workers um, 
do contract the virus. And so, you know, whether that is through um, community spread or through contact with patients, it, it's really hard to tease that sort of data out. Uh, but, but we also know that uh, the number of, of, of employees um, of our healthcare providers, of our staff, uh, that is, have been infected is, is a pretty low percentage uh, compared to our entire employee population. Um, you know, our, 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 our staff, our workforce is very well in tuned uh, with this, this disease. And, and um, we've taken steps to help them as well in protecting their family. So if, if somebody um, either uh, feels um, if they've been working with, with COVID patients and, and feels um, anxious about going home, we've uh, provided housing for them uh, so that they wouldn't have to expose their families, as well as if people needed to quarantine away from their families, um, th there's safe avenues to do that as well. This reporter's heard that uh, there are some discussions about a form of widespread testing to gauge the extent of infection. Mm -hmm. Do you have any information about whether the task force or some other entity will be conducting any form of widespread testing? What they're talking about is a prevalence-based study. And so there's uh, been numerous um, studies that have been in the media here lately. You've probably heard the ones from New York, from LA, um, countries like Germany, other places. Um, they've mostly done uh, what's called seroprevalence studies, so looking for antibodies in the blood. Um, the state of Missouri has embarked on a, uh, a prevalence study, although it's, it's more of a focused prevalence study, so they're looking at certain areas of the state. Um, and then there has been discussion within uh, the St. Louis region as well as doing the same thing. Um, so then the question is, should it be a, um, a, a PCR-based study, which is um, looking for active infection, uh, versus a, a seroprevalence study, which is really looking for prior exposure? And so those discussions are, are ongoing with public health right now. Jefferson County and St. Charles County have both announced that they plan to follow Governor Parson's reopening plan on Monday, May 4th. Mm -hmm. um, what have you seen in any tr hospital trends in those areas? Um, do you think those um, figures warrant an easing of restrictions? It's challenging to, um, again, uh, understand what's happening within those populations according to hospitalization data. So we're getting more and more um, data on, so what, what you really wanna know is how many active infections there are in the community, not necessarily you know, um, admissions at those hospitals, because as you might expect, people from Jefferson County or Franklin County will come to St. Louis hospitals within the St. Louis metro area uh, for their care. And so really the key is looking at the number of cases that occur uh, within those communities. Um, so uh, as I've mentioned in the past, we've um, developed a plan to pull all of our data together, BJC, SSM, St. Luke's, and uh, Mercy, uh, so that we can start getting that granular level of data on who has been hospitalized and where do they come from. And we expect to have that uh, up and running, I, I believe, by the end of the week. Do you worry that easing stay-at-home orders in much of Missouri on May 4th will undermine the St. Louis region's efforts to slow the spread of the virus? Well, well, anytime you do something that increases the probability of transmission, you're always worried about the number of cases that come along with it. Um, and so, uh, of, of course, you would be concerned um, that, uh, that steps that have been, uh, that are taken um, where people become or in contact with each other more and more, um, that that does increase the probability of transmission. So, but really the key is um, how do we reduce the rate of transmission? And those are things such as making sure we're still following social distancing rules, uh, making sure we're doing things like washing hands, keeping surfaces clean, wearing masks out in public. Um, things like that, and then also that uh, public health response with, with testing people that are sick, um, doing uh, contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine. So, um, so the the question really isn't hinged as much about um, you know that uh, that opening from from those different counties. It's what are those mechanisms that we have in place uh, to really control spread. You can, you can control spread while opening the economy. You just have to make sure that you're doing it well. 
and the community has to be invested in that process of doing it well. It's, it's really incumbent upon everybody. Do you have a sense of when St. Louis area hospitals will be able to resume elective surgeries? A very um, difficult question to answer. And so uh, in some ways it, it mirrors sort of the reopening of the economy. So of course we wanna see the number of COVID patients in our hospitals coming down uh, at a steady rate as well. Uh, we want to make sure that our workforce is going to be able to handle uh, more patients coming in. We want to make sure that we have personal protective equipment uh, because as you can imagine, when you're doing surgeries, that takes up personal protective equipment. And so you wanna make sure that you, you have enough supplies in order to take care of all of those. And then lastly, on the, on the testing front, you want to make sure that you're able to test people as well um, that are coming in for things like, you know, knee surgeries and stuff like that, because you don't want to bring somebody who could be an asymptomatic uh, person who's infected into the operating room and potentially expose, you know, the, the workforce. So there's um, just like reopening the economy, there's a lot of building blocks that need to be put in place before we'd feel comfortable by saying, yes, let's start doing elective surgeries. Are there regional projections for what could happen to our COVID caseload as restrictions are either lifted or loosened? The, the question really isn't about the restriction. The, the question is about transmission. So as I mentioned previously, you can, you can reduce the restrictions if you do a very good job of keeping transmissions low. And so, um, so, so that's really the question. So if we, if we, so for instance, if we went back to the way life was before COVID started with absolutely no social restrictions, you know, uh, people interacting, um, you know, large gatherings, things like that, absolutely that will drive our case rate uh, up. No, no question about that. So the, the answer to that question is really dependent upon what sort of mitigation efforts do we have in place to keep the transmission number low? If you can do that through the public health measures and through all the social distancing rules, um, then, then it is possible uh, to, to open you know, more of the economy and more of society. But the key is to keep the transmission rate low. Is there expected to be a second bump or a peak? And um, are there estimates that quantify how large uh, that could be? So again, it's uh, it's all dependent upon transmission. So uh, and I hate to sound like you know I'm beating a drum here, but 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 I am. Um, so if if we approximate that the transmission rate is going to go up, then um, our models show cases going up. Uh, it's it's that simple, uh, and it's all based on probability of infection, which leads to cases. So of course, as healthcare systems, we're very concerned about a second peak. And we're concerned about increased transmission rates. And so it's incumbent upon us to sort of draw that out. So if that transmission rate increases by so much, what does that mean on the back end? And that's really no different than when we were preparing for the initial wave, when we were modeling these things out. What should we be expecting? What should we be planning for? What sorts of things should we be advocating for to keep the transmission rate low? When you talk about models and projections, who produced those? So there's a, a group of uh, data scientists. Um, so I'll, I'll, again, take us back to when we first started uh, forming this task force. We brought together our analytic power between SSM, BJC, Mercy, St. Luke's, WashU, St. Louis University to come together to build these models. And those are the models that I've, I've shown you repeatedly on, on our press conferences. And so that is the group that we have tasked with taking a look at all of these different uh, scenarios to give us a best estimate on what we should be planning for. And again, it's, um, it's incumbent upon us to be prepared to take care of, of these patients. So we have to be able to understand what is, uh, what is the projected caseload that we could be thinking about? Um, it's, it's really important for us as, as sort of the, the receiver of if there are in, increased cases to be able to provide that in a, in a safe environment. Have there been examples of second waves in other places? And if so, 
what lessons do those places offer that our region can and should take into account? So you've seen me show the slide of the 1918 pandemic. So, so there's one uh, in St. Louis and, and it was correlated with uh, reopening the economy. Um, so that second wave came along because of that. Um, one of the more uh, timely ones though is the second wave that, um, that occurred in Singapore um, after they had really, uh, really blunted their first wave. They were, they were um, really a model of, of how to do that. Uh, but what they learned from that is it was um, areas of concentrated transmission. So it was, it was young uh, construction workers that were living in very densely populated areas where the spread was occurring. And I think that the lesson learned from that is, is as we become better at identifying where transmission is occurring, that we can then focus efforts on those areas um, to really drive transmission down. If you think about it, there's there's some areas in the community that are more at risk per spread, whether that's from urban dense living uh, rather than more rural dispersed populations, people with more comorbid disease, things like that, that uh, if, we, if we have good data that says this is where it's occurring, then we can, we can react faster and try and drive transmission down. The FDA plans to announce as early as today an emergency use authorization for remdesivir. What is your reaction to that news? And would it be a treatment we could see in the St. Louis area? Uh, so my reaction to that is that it's good news. Um, there was some preliminary data that came out that was very promising. I think most people uh, saw or heard Dr. Fauci yesterday um, uh, you know, talking about um, some of the outcomes from those studies, and they were very promising. Um, and so it's, again, it's another useful tool uh, for treating uh, COVID patients, was originally developed to treat Ebola patients and then uh, was, was brought off the shelf to see if it worked for COVID patients. And thankfully, it looks like it has a lot of promise. And so um, uh, there, there is opportunity to use it in the St. Louis hospitals. Is it safe to assume the decline in patients on ventilators is because those patients have died? If not, can you give us the percentages um, on patients on ventilators who survive and those who, who died? Um, so so th that's not a correct assumption. Uh, in fact, the, the opposite is actually true. Um, so uh, because uh, we've been learning a lot of what works um, therapeutically uh, from, from other regions that have been hit really hard, uh, reading in medical journals, and, and frankly, a lot of discussion between clinicians, um, we we've, have improved our, our therapy for COVID patients. And so what we're actually seeing is patients that potentially early on in, in the pandemic would have most likely gone on a ventilator are now not having to go on the ventilator because of different techniques um, that we're using, such as proning and high flow nasal oxygen, things like that. And so actually the reverse is true, uh, that there's less patients actually going on uh, ventilators because of that. Um, I don't really have the statistics for, for mortality of people that are on ventilators or not. Is it a safe assumption that every patient who has died from COVID-19 was on ventilator care at some point? Uh, no, I, I, well, I wouldn't be able to answer that precisely, but my overall answer would be no. Um, you know, people die in the hospital every day and not all of them are on ventilators. There's a lot of other things that go into whether somebody lives or dies, and it's not just primarily dependent on the ventilator, in including you know people that have living wills and, and other sorts of things. So it, it's not a uh, you know it, it, there is no common pathway for when somebody dies of COVID. You said yesterday that you thought the decline in hospitalizations was coming soon. When the downward trend occurs, what number of hospitalizations would you expect to see it? Tough question to answer, and I think it depends on day. Uh, so uh, overall, we expect the trend to keep coming down. And so how fast it comes down is entirely dependent upon transmission in the community. Uh, so again, you'll hear me go back to transmission. So uh, if the transmission remains low, that means less infections, less people in the hospital, and there'll be a steeper decline in time. Now remember, the, the trend that we're looking at uh, now going forward is from infections that happened you know, 7, 10, 14 days ago because that's how much time it takes 
to develop symptoms, get admitted to the hospital, stay in the hospital, eventually get discharged. So, uh, so we're taking care of, of patients that were infected, you know, up to two weeks ago. Um, so that rate of decline is dependent upon uh, what that transmission rate was two weeks ago. So I, I guess the takeaway point is if, if we as a community want to see that trend continue to go down, then it's incumbent upon us to keep that transmission rate low by following all of those practices that we've been following uh, for the last five weeks. Thank you. That concludes the list of questions received from members of the media prior to and during today's briefing. In the morning, we'll accept questions from members of the media for tomorrow afternoon's live stream. Thank you for tuning in.